so good evening everyone uh, are there any queries from the previous session is there anyone who is joining for the first time <laughs> okay so we'll begin uh, from where we left last time so let me go back to the slides Uh, apologies for my voice today. Uh, I'm not doing well, so it may not be audible. Okay, so in the last class, uh, we reviewed some of these topics like hypothesis testing, what hypothesis testing is, how to for, uh, develop a null and alternate hypothesis depending on the problem at hand. And we saw type 1 and type 2 errors and also we looked into different types of tests like uh, we look basically looked into Z, Z test and we will be discussing T test in detail today. So in Z test we saw one tail test and two tail test and how to solve this hypothesis testing using three approaches basically P value, critical value and confidence level uh, approach and we looked into some Python programs as well. So we will look into the T test program problems and uh, after that we will move on to two sample hypothesis testing. So are there any queries in this part? The things that we have di not discussed in detail was uh, proportion based tests and uh, the tests involving variances. So I will leave that part for now because the concepts are like almost uh, similar. Like you will have to have some sort of a hypothesis like formulate hypothesis null or an alternate and based on that you will have to have some test statistic and then uh, compute p value or critical value whatever approach you want to have and accordingly do the testing. So if you get the intuition behind what we are doing so I think you can extrapolate it to interpolate it to uh, uh, the pro sample proposal proportion based and the variance based tests okay so i assume that you have no queries till now like if you have please feel free to interrupt me okay fine so let us see some questions and then we'll also look into certain python programs in this session so here is the first question Suppose you want to test whether a newly developed vaccine V would be efficient in curing a di certain disease D. The null hypothesis is V cures D and the alternate hypothesis is V does not cure D. You deduce that V does not cure D. However, the reality is that V cures D. What kind of error did you make here? I repeat there are uh, so you have a newly developed vaccine and you have two or two hypotheses over here the null hypothesis is V cures D and the alternate hypothesis is V does not cure D so and you did some hypothesis testing and you are deducing that V does not cure D so however in the reality like uh, the reality is like V cures D that is the correct option correct thing. So what kind of error you are making over here? Okay, somebody says type 2 error. Okay, what about the others? Yeah, please feel free to answer like uh, it's not being graded. So we are here to learn. Anyone else? What kind of error are we making over here? Okay. Uh, can anyone define what type 1 and type 2 errors are? <laughs> okay, think over it. Yes, uh, Akhilesh ji, you I have think, uh -huh. I think uh, type 1 error is uh, committed when H0 is uh, right and we are uh, considering it is uh, not correct. Yes. So in this case, what's happening? 
So H A B we are neglecting. Uh, we are accepting that uh, V does not cure D. So we are deducing that V does not cure D, but in reality V cures D. So here H not is correct, and we are rejecting H not. So what kind of error we are making over here? In this case, H not is correct, but we are rejecting H not. You just answered it. So yeah, type one error. Yeah, so it is type one error. Okay, so how can this issue be addressed? Like, when does type one error occur? is there anyway this is a theoretical question like not relating to like you might not be getting such sort of a same as like uh, theoretical questions in your examination mostly it will be mcq based i'm not very sure about it but yeah uh, it is just for the information like if we are having more type 1 error or uh, what does it mean like how can we resolve that type 1 error to reduce type 1 error what should we do anyone any guess okay let me go back to ipad and let us take one hypothetical example and then see like how we do hypothesis testing and then based on that you maybe you will get an idea like what we can do to reduce type 1 errors uh kajal you have any answer no sir okay fine uh please uh give me a Okay, is my iPad screen visible? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so for any test, uh, I request everyone to be on mute, please. Okay. So based on the nature of alternate hypothesis, we uh, decide whether it is going to be one tail test, two tail test. okay so always the equality will be in the null hypothesis and the so for example mu greater than equal to say some value mu not or mu equal to some value mu not or mu less than equal to uh, some value mu not so this all are your null hypothesis like the variations of null hypothesis so equality sign will always be in null hypothesis your alternate hypothesis will accordingly be set there so in this case in the first case alternate hypothesis will be less than mu not in this case mu not equal to mu not and mu greater than mu not so in this case the depending on the sign over here we'll have to decide whether we are going to go have one tail test or two tail test and if it is one tail test whether we are going to have the lower tail test or the upper tail test so in this case we are going to have which kind of test can anyone answer if my alternate hypothesis is mu less than mu not okay let me quickly answer it we are going to have lower tail test that's correct in case mu is greater than mu not so we will go for the upper tail test and 
in the third case that is mu equal to mu naught it has two uh, things mu either mu is less than mu naught or mu is greater than mu naught okay so in that case we'll go for two tail test now what this region over here depicts so you are, would have heard this term alpha which is level of significance so it is nothing but probability of making type 1 error so what is type 1 error so first of all for any hypothesis sorry for any hypothesis testing you compute z statistic uh, we are just uh, looking at the z test right now as of now so you have been given sample uh, population uh, parameters population mean population standard deviation sample size and sample mean so based on this you will compute your z statistic which is nothing but x bar minus mu upon sigma by root n and in the last class we discussed like why we are doing this we are kind of transforming a normal distribution in z space sorry in x space x is a random variable to this z space and converting it to standard normal distribution why because we know the values of standard normal distribution like we given the z value we can easily compute area under the curve and what is area under the curve for a normal distribution or any kind of uh, continuous distribution it is nothing but probability so this probab this area over here the blue area over here it shows the probability of occurrence of event having z value greater than or equal to this particular z value whatever z value is over here that is the probability of occurrence of the event greater than or equal to z okay so if you are given a value of alpha say alpha is 0.5 or 5% so there are 5% chances of making an error or a 5% probability of rejecting your null hypothesis now what is null hypothesis and where is null hypothesis coming into picture so here the assumption is that when the null hypothesis is true then this particular expression over here x bar minus mu upon sigma by root n it will follow a normal distribution and that's our basic assumption so when this uh, null hypothesis is true this statistic will follow a standard norm, like a normal distribution standard normal distribution and we are assuming that null hypothesis is true and there are chances of making 5 percent errors or uh, there is 5 percent probability of making or rejecting null hypothesis provided uh, such error events occur so in case of one tail test if it is upper tail test we assume that this area which is nothing but alpha or probability of rejecting null hypothesis or making type 1 error is concentrated on the left side uh, sorry right side upper tail in case of lower tail test we will assume this area is concentrated towards the lower side or the left side and and these these are all probabilities by the way and in the two tail test this is alpha by 2 alpha by 2 so sum of this two is alpha okay so now so how we are doing uh, the hypothesis testing first 
let us see the critical value approach. So given this alpha, we will we can find the corresponding z alpha. Z alpha. Does everyone agree with this? Any query on this? Like how we will do this? Uh, just one moment. Moment. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, there is the assumption that our error chances of error will be only five percent, whether it is single tail test or double tail test. Yes. Is it so better? yeah, so given the value of alpha, uh, it is fixed that the probability of making type one error or rejecting null hypothesis will be, when it is true, will be alpha or uh, whatever value of alpha it is. So. If it is a single tail test, the alpha will be like concentrated over one of the tails, and if it is two tail tests, the alpha will be like concentrated. Uh, the probabilities will be like uh, towards both the tail ends. So you'll have to uh, do the test accordingly. Uh, Akhilesh, does that answer your query? Sometimes value of alpha is also given, or generally we take uh, five percent only. Yeah. So. 5% alpha is 0 0.05 in this case. In this case also yeah. alpha is 0 0.05. In this case also alpha is 0 0.05, but it is divided into two. So it two is 0 0.025 and 0 0.025. So total error will be 2, 0 0.05. 0 0.05, yeah, that's true. Okay, so given this area under the curve, I can always find Z alpha value, which is Nothing but can anyone quickly answer what it is, like how we can do it in terms of CDL? Or last time we saw PPF function as well. Yeah, PPF of 0 0.7, no, not, not really. So when you give PPF, you will have to give this area, this yellow area over here. So it will be PPF of 1 minus alpha, okay. Uh, Samitra, is that uh, clear to you? Because PPF is nothing but inverse of uh, CDF. So c this yellow area is nothing but CDF of Z alpha, okay. And PPF of this area will give you Z alpha. For those of you who do not know what PPF is, PPF is percent point function. So given this area, so area under the curve less than equal to Z alpha or probability. is your CDF, cumulative distribution function. And given this CDF, I can always find this particular value of Z alpha using PPF, percent point function, okay. So alpha is given to us, so we can always compute 1 minus alpha and get this yellow region, area of yellow region and then we will compute Z alpha. Now once we compute Z alpha, we will have our test statistic which is x bar minus mu upon sigma by root 10 and depending on where this z lies, if this z lie over here after this z alpha, then we say that we are rejecting null hypothesis because the probability of z, say z is over here, the probability of occurrence of z and the values greater than z is less than the probability of making type 1 error. So this is significant, statistically significant and hence we are rejecting null hypothesis over here. In case this z would have been over here. So it means that the probability of getting z and the values greater than z is greater than the probability of making type 1 error or alpha, this area under the curve is known as p-value by the way. So if z lies 
over here after z alpha in the case of a Patel test. So there are two ways z greater than z alpha which also implies the p value will be less than alpha. And in the other case z less than z alpha the p value will be greater than alpha. So when this is the case this blue color then we are going to reject our null hypothesis. If this is the case we are going to accept but generally we do not say accept null hypothesis we say we, we do not reject null hypothesis because we do not have enough statistical evidence to reject our null hypothesis. So, you in the literature you might be seeing this kind of a use of terminology like we do not reject null hypothesis ok. So, this is the case in this case we are doing the similar sort of operations, but here depending on the value of z alpha uh, sorry z alpha whatever z statistic we get if it is beyond z alpha towards left we are going to reject our null hypothesis if z is towards the right we are going to accept a null hypothesis or do not reject our null hypothesis. Similarly in this case the z may, may lie so you will get positive z and the negative z corresponding to your statistic whatever sample statistic you have x bar. So, if it lies towards this towards the right of z al alpha by 2 over the upper tail you are going to reject null hypothesis and other way around. So, this region where we accept null hypothesis or do not reject null hypothesis is our acceptance region and this is our rejection region and this particular value is known as critical value z alpha by 2 in this case and z alpha in the other case. So, reject accept. So, if z lies in the acceptance region we are going to accept a null hypothesis or do not reject a null hypothesis and if it lies in the rejection region we are definitely going to reject a null hypothesis ok. So, here what can we do like to ensure that we do not reject our null hypothesis to re, uh, reduce the rejection rate of null hypothesis what are the possibilities anyone alpha is nothing but our probability of making type 1 error or rejecting null hypothesis when it is true. So, how can we tackle this what uh, changes can we make to alpha to ensure that we do not reject null hypothesis unnecessarily. Anyone? Any guess? Should we increase alpha or decrease alpha? Increase alpha. Okay, if we increase alpha, reduce. Ok, uh, 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 somebody said increase alpha. So, if we increase alpha uh, what is hap what will happen to the rejection region? Is it going to increase that or decrease? That will increase. Yeah, so rejection region will increase and our right. chances of rejecting null hypothesis will increase right. More. Yeah. yeah, so in that case you will have to decrease alpha ok. So, alpha should be lowered down to avoid type 1 errors or rejecting null hypothesis. So, that was the question that was asked over there. So, let me stop the share over here. So, how this issue can be addressed? So, the answer is by decreasing the significance level. Now, we have another question. Suppose you work in a space research organization, ok let me go back over here, I hope it is readable. Uh, you gather some data about a mysterious body B, 
near a planet's orbit using observation from a giant space telescope. Uh, you want to test whether B is a uh, space debris or an alien ship. So your yeah, alternate hi uh, null hypothesis is B is an alien ship and alternate hypothesis is B is space debris. Okay, so you deduce that B is an alien ship. However, in the reality, uh, reality is that B is just a space debris. So, what kind of error did you make over here? Okay, somebody says type two. What about the others? Think over it. Yeah, please think over it and uh, try to answer. And then we'll discuss it in detail. Okay, uh, others, please try to answer. Is there any uh, query in the question? Like, uh, did you understand what the question says? Okay, so let us go to the question and see. The null hypothesis is B is an alien ship, and alternate hypothesis is B is space debris. So it's not an alien ship; it's some debris in the space, maybe some asteroid or something. So, uh, after doing hypothesis testing, we deduce that B is an alien ship. We accepted null hypothesis. However, the reality is that B is just a space debris. So, what kind of error? So, we are accepting null hypothesis when it is false. So, when we accept null hypothesis when it is false, we are making type 2 error. So, the correct answer is type 2 error. So, how this issue can be addressed? So, we just discussed for type 1 error to reduce type 1 error, we will increase or we will decrease alpha. And uh, now, in this case, to reduce type 2 error, what we will do? We do not want to unnecessarily accept null hypothesis. So, what are we going to do in this case to the value of alpha? Anyone? Yes. So, we are going to increase alpha. So, increase alpha. Yes, that is correct. Thanks. So, I hope it is clear to everyone. Okay, next question and we will uh, we'll see some python programs after this like and we will also discuss some of the other topics like uh, t-test and two, two sample t-test and uh, we will move on to ANOVA. I do not think so, I will be able to cover uh, like randomized block design and two way ANOVA and uh, linear regression but yeah we will see step by step like what all we can cover in this session. Okay, and for those who are joining for the first time, like who may not be knowing, uh, like let me just share the link to my YouTube channel where the recordings of the previous sessions are available. So I'll just share it in chat. So if you have missed any of the sessions and would like to go and revisit that, uh, please feel free to uh, do so. And the link is over here in the chat. And for those who do not know, like the material that I am using, like the slides and uh, other things. Okay, let me share this tab instead. Okay, so whatever uh, slides and Python notebooks will be available over here at this link. So this is a link to a Google Drive folder. Let me click on this. So it will redirect you to a Drive folder where you can access the material for every week. Just a minute, a week five folder is empty, I think. 
Uh, yeah, week 5 folder was empty because last time we covered mostly the week 4 content. So you might find it over here in the week 4. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'll be uh, today I'll be uploading this week five. So actually, whatever questions we are discussing are from week five slides. So yeah, I'll upload it after this session, right after this session. Like this uh, slides are like basically uh, from week five. Uh, we actually were running one week uh, uh, behind the schedule, so uh, I was kind to trying to like uh, match the pace of the lectures or the videos that are being released but it's very difficult actually like uh, seeing the background of multiple people over here like everyone is coming from diverse backgrounds and they may not be knowing the basics and it doesn't make sense to me like to cover all the advanced topics like and then bombard them with all the jargons so yeah i i try to be slow but if you're finding it difficult like uh, please let me know like i'll redirect you to some other material where you can clear up your doubts like if you want to solve those assignments uh, at a faster pace like there are other i think <laughs> i think that would be better yeah so i'll i'll just uh, share certain uh, videos also like in the uh, video description like the youtube video description where you can go and uh, explore the concepts in more detail yeah so and for those of you who are finding this sessions very basic it's not mandatory to attend uh, please feel free to leave whenever you uh, want to and you can re always revisit these sessions like the recordings of the sessions later and watch them at your own pace like you can watch them in 2x if these are like very slow so yeah but if you have any queries please feel free to ask during these sessions and i'll be happy to answer and if I am not uh, able to do that, I'll definitely try to answer it in the next session. Okay. So let us move on to the next question. Suppose you are a professional chess player. I hope the screen is visible. Suppose you are a ch professional chess player participating in a prestigious cycle of tournaments. You have set a goal for yourself to win an average of 50 games or more in the whole cycle. After the initial few days of, two, of the tournament, you observe based on a random sample of 20 games that you are winning an average of 7 games. How would you formu formulate the null hypothesis in this case? Uh, yes, uh, Ravant, I will be sharing uh, all these slides with you. So the slides will be uploaded to the folder. Okay, so any query? Fine. So, what will be the null hypothesis in this case? Okay, please read the question carefully. After initial few days of tournament, okay, uh, you'll have to read this first. You have set a goal for yourself to win an average of 50 games or more in the whole cycle. After initial few days of tournament, you observe based on a random sample of 20 games that you are winning an average of 7 games. Okay, what about the others? Please try to answer. Okay, I give you some time. Please think over it and try to answer. It's fine if you make mistake. Uh, I just want to know like uh, whether you have understood the concept or not. Okay. Let us discuss this. So here, this is the hint over here. You have set a goal for yourself to win an average of 50 games or more in the whole cycle. So you are expecting to win at least 50 games. So your average is expected to be 50 or more than 50. So the answer should be 
d that your the average uh, number of games that you are going to win uh, is more than 50 50 or more than 50 and as we as i said a null hypothesis will always have this equality so it will never be like this greater than 50 or less than 50 there will be always one equality sign associated in the null hypothesis so the correct option is option d okay next question After this, we will discuss uh, the further topics. Suppose you have a pond near your home. There are several species of fishes living in the pond. Out of these two species, F1 and F2 are of most interest to you. And you want to know whether the mean length of these fishes is same or does it differ according to their species? What would, you, would the hypothesis look like and what test would you use? Any answer? Should be A. Okay, Bhumi. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, what about the others? Did you get the question? Yeah, please think over it. And okay, okay. So many are answering A. Yeah, that's the right answer. U one equal to mu two, and we are going to do t test when the population standard deviation is unknown. Here, in this information, you cannot see like uh, population standard deviation is given to you. You only you know the mean length of this species. That is the population mean. So in that case, you'll go for t test. So by the way, like uh, there were like multiple uh, versions of t test. So let me go back to iPad and then we'll discuss that. Okay, I hope my iPad screen is visible. Uh, can someone please confirm? Yes, it is visible. Okay, thank you. So in the Z test, we're computing the Z statistic as X bar minus mu upon sigma by root n. So there the assumption was that you know the population standard deviation. But in many of the cases, real world scenario, it is very difficult to have this information of uh, population standard deviation available with us. So in that case, we will be having certain sample with us and we will be computing the sample standard deviation that is S. So instead of population standard deviation, we will be using uh, sample standard deviation and our statistic will change accordingly. So in this case, we tend to use t-test. So what is t-test? So it comes from t-distribution. When it is z-test, the underlying distribution is a normal distribution. And for t-test, it's t-distribution, which is very similar to normal distribution. Okay, let me draw it better in a better way. So the standard normal distribution will look like something like this and if you see t, t distribution it will be something over like this so uh, i request everyone to be on mute okay so in this case if you see the tells in the case of t just one thing i want to ask mm -hmm. size of 
Uh, I was just asking, size of sample will also matter regarding T and yes, Z in, besides this uh, standard deviation? Uh, size of sample, yes, it does matter because your, so what we are doing basically, like in case of one sample tests, like single population test, so in that case, you are having this distribution of sample means. So you are taking samples of si different sizes, like uh, say size n, and you are taking mean of that and then this distribution is nothing but distribution of sample means okay and in one of the sessions we saw this like we simulated it like changing the size of this sample will affect the accuracy in the sense that if you have more like larger sample size uh, there are higher probability of the distribution being closer or the mean of this distribution of sample means being closer to the actual population mean mu okay so they either you have to increase the sample size or you will have to take more number of samples so these are the two ways so here let me go back to so in that case of t distribution if you see the tails over here these are fatter compared to the normal distribution both are having uh, area under the curve one like if you take the area under the curve for normal distribution as well as t distribution both have probability distributions so uh, the area under the curve is definitely one and the parameters of normal distributions are mean and sigma that is mean and the standard deviation and for t distribution it is degrees of freedom and in the last class we discussed what degrees of freedom are like say you have a sample of uh, n data points and you can compute mean of that right so given the sample size mean and the n minus 1 data points you can always compute this nth data point right so this n minus 1 data points are independent and are free to vary but once it is given to you uh, like uh, once mean and the size of the samples or the sample size is given to you n minus 1 data points are free to move vary and the value of the n plus, uh, nth data point will be dependent on these values n minus 1 values so you have n minus 1 degrees of freedom in this case so i want you to uh, go and explore more like what degrees of freedoms are like in different contexts but in the case of t distribution you have only one parameter that is degrees of freedom and if you see the uh, function for this normal distribution it is 1 over root 2 pi sigma square under root e to the power x minus mu square upon sigma square okay and so this is for normal distribution and if you see for t distribution t distribution it is a bit complicated okay let me just share it over here let us go to wikipedia and see the formula Also, uh, just uh, for your information, just look into the history of T distribution, like how it was formed. Okay, so here is the PDF of T distribution. I hope it is visible to everyone. So it's a bit uh, complicated over here. So this parameter that you see V in this case, it is the degree of freedom. And this thing is the gamma function. You need not bother about it, like uh, about the mathematics behind it. The thing that I wanted to point it out over here is that the parameter over here of the distribution, which is V or the degrees of freedom, which is always positive. Okay. So let us go back to iPad. Let me, let me stop here over here.
So the property of T T distribution is, as you increase the sample size, this T distribution will tend towards normal distribution. Like the more number of samples you take, this T distribution will try uh, like will become uh, closer and closer to your normal distribution. Like this particular blue color thing is having like more number of samples. So in general, it is assumed that uh, it is seen in the Z uh, table. If the size of sample is greater than 30, the T value and the Z values will always almost be similar. So when you have the sample size of more than 30, in that case you can uh, definitely look at the Z table directly. Uh, because the values of T uh, distribution and the Z distribution or the normal distribution will almost be similar. Okay, the only thing is you will have to take so in that case you will have to compute the statistic using the sta sample standard deviation and not the population standard deviation that is not known to you. But whatever statistic you get you can always compute the p value using the z table. Okay. So that was about the t test for single population. Now the question is of two population. Here uh, what we were interested in was like are we which problem did we discuss just now? Fishes, right? So we have two, two fishes. One fish is F1 which is having its own distribution and another fish is F2. Now the question is whether the two distributions are significantly different or not. That is the means of this fish 1 and fish 2 are different or not. And our null hypothesis in this case say it is like mu 1 and mu 2. Null hypothesis is mu 1 equal to mu 2 and alternate hypothesis mu 1 not equal to mu 2. Okay. So in this case our statistics will be dependent on whether we know the population standard deviation or not. That is we know sigma 1, sigma 2 or not. If these are known the t statistic will be different. With so in this case in the single population scenario the degrees of freedom for t value for any t statistic will be sample size minus 1. In this case it varies depending on whether uh, population standard deviation is known or not known. And if it is known uh, are we going to take pooled sample uh, pooled variance or uh, like are we going to assume that the variances are same or the variances or the standard deviations are different. So yeah we will try to see some problem and we will see some of these cases but yeah there are more details given in the slides by Professor, Ram Professor Ramesh. So please do look into it we will try to solve some problems on this and we will see the details. Okay. So let me go back to the question. Okay. So in this case, we are going to have this uh, t test with sigma unknown, where we are assuming null hypothesis as mu one equal to mu two. That is the means of the uh, populations for two species of fishes are the same. Okay. Uh, let me just see like if I have that material with me like the different cases where, where like for t test let me just check it once quickly and then we will discuss that. Uh, please give me your some time. Yeah, meanwhile you can ask your queries like if you have any queries.
Okay, I've got it. Let me share it. Okay, uh, please uh, excuse my handwriting over here. I was writing on iPad and it's not that great. Okay. So we are concerned about population means of two distributions or two groups. So condition one is like sigma 1 square and sigma 2 square are known. So in this case we are going to use z test. If these are unknown, we will go for t test okay. and when sigma 1 square and sigma 2 squares are known and Okay. So, uh, by the way, do you know the property of variance? Variance of a x is a square times variance of x. Uh, I assume that the you know some basics of uh, probability theory that expectations and variances, properties of expectation and variance. So, if you don't know, like. Uh, uh, just keep this in mind okay and then there is one more property variance of x1 minus x2 is variance of x1 plus variance of x2 this minus gets converted to plus over here now there is a derivation for this uh, we won't go into the detailed derivation so this particular term over here the variance of x1 minus x2. So we are taking x1 is coming from x1 bar is coming from one population and x2 bar is coming from another population and your, your sample statistics is the differences of the means of this sample uh, uh, like uh, means of the two samples coming from different population. So if you take the variance of that it will be variance of first plus variance of second one and which is nothing but sigma 1 square by n1 and sigma 2 square by n2 okay by root n oh sorry my mistake okay Okay, it's coming from this formula, uh, this property of the variance. Okay, now you have variance, so you will compute z, z statistics. It is very similar to what you used to do earlier. The only difference over here is you are taking this uh, differences of the means into consideration. There it was x bar minus mu upon sigma by root n. Here, in this case, it is x1 bar minus x2 bar minus mu1 minus mu2 upon this particular variance of the difference of the sample means. Okay. So once you have this z value, the other steps are similar. What you used to do. Fine. Now the second case was sigma square, sigma 1 square and sigma 2 squares are unknown means the population standard deviations are unknown. In that case, there are two assumptions. Either the two populations are having same variance or they are having different variance. So in both of the cases, we are going to have t-test. So in the first case, where the population, sorry, <coughs> where the population variance is same, variances are same, the T test will have the T distribution that we are going to have the T statistic will be having uh, degrees of freedom n1 plus n2 minus 2 uh, and uh, the T statistics will be computed as x1 bar minus x2 bar minus mu1 minus mu2 similar to what we used to do we are doing in Z test instead of population standard deviation or population variance you are having here sample standard deviation but in this case you will have to notice this is the pooled sample standard deviation so what do you mean by pool so sp pool 
will be computed as n1 where which is the sample size of uh, first uh, population or uh, like uh, first uh, uh, like prop, uh, like sample from the first population n1 minus 1 into s1 square plus n2 minus 1 into s2 square upon n1 plus n2 minus 2. So this is the pooled variance that you are computing using which you will compute the t statistics which is having this n1 plus n2 minus 2 uh, degrees of freedom. We will see some python example uh, like how to solve these problems over there. And if in the second case if uh, see uh, like the population standard deviations or the population variances are like the two populations are having different variances in that case it is going to be a bit complicated. The degrees of freedom is computed using this very complex formula. Uh, uh, you need not bother much about the derivations and all, it is not expected in this course uh, for you to know all these things, but this is just for your information like in case it, it is asked in the question. So just remember all this uh, basics thing like you need not go into the derivation of all this stuff. So once you have this degrees of freedom, then similarly over here you can compute the t statistics, but in this case you are assuming. Uh, like the two standard deviations are different. So you are taking S1 square and S2 square. In this case you are, in this particular case you are taking pooled sample standard deviation. In this case you are taking the individual ones. So that is the only difference. So this was all about like uh, uh, working with two population means, like seeing the statistical significance for the differences of two population means and we will see some problems in python and try to solve them. Okay. So let us go back to slides. Okay. So let us see. Uh, let us go to the python notebook yeah so here is an example uh, it is from the uh, like course material itself like from the slides so a product developer is interested in reducing the drying time of a primer paint two formulations of the paint are tested formulation one is standard chemistry and formulation two has a new drying Sorry, time. You're not able to see the screen oh i see oh thanks thanks for informing and another thing, uh, Sesh, uh -huh. uh, sorry to interrupt. So uh, actually, actually, I've joined late now. Okay. Uh, like, have you discussed the? Are you discussing the week five topics today, or? Uh, uh, the, I discuss some basic week five topics, and we'll move on to ANOVA after that. Like, so we discuss, uh, like we recap whatever we discussed in the previous session, like Z test and what is level of significance and uh, how to do a hypo uh, hypothesis testing. Okay. And then we moved on to uh, t test, and then we discussed like uh, two sample t test briefly. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so we are discussing a problem relating to that now in Python. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. So, yes. sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, just take um, uh, 30 seconds. I, I also joined a bit late. Uh -huh. uh, are these are these by any chance these these uh, sessions are getting recorded? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all these sessions are getting recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube channel. Like, let me just share the YouTube channel link with you here. Thank you. So if you have missed any of these sessions, you can definitely go back and look into them. So Thanks. yeah, I have put the link in the chat. Thanks a lot. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So a product developer is interested in reducing the drying time of a primer paint. Two formulations of the paint are tested. Formulation one is a standard chemistry, and formulation two has a new drying ingredient that should be reduce that should reduce the drying time. From experience, it is known that the standard deviation of drying time is eight minutes, and this inherent variability should be unaffected by the addition of the new ingredient. Ten specimens are pre, uh, painted with formulation one, and another ten specimen specimens are uh, painted with formulation 2. So there are two paints uh, form with formulation 1 and formulation 2. Both are having some different chemical content. Uh, the, okay, and the 20 spe specimens like 10 were painted with uh, formulation 1 and 10 with form formulation 2 and the 20 were like painted in random order. 
to avoid any bias. The two sample average drawing time are x1 bar, means whatever the strain samples were for that, x1 bar is 121 minutes and x2 bar is 112 minutes respectively. What conclusions can the product developer draw from the effectiveness of the in new ingredient using the uh, alpha value that, the, that is the significance level of 5%? Okay, so what is the data given over here? You have two paints, uh, one is with formulation 1 and one is another is with formulation 2 which is having some better ingredient and the claim of the manufacturer or the developer is that this new ingredient will decrease the or reduce the drying time like the paint will dry faster. So uh, from the experience like it is given that the standard deviation of drying time is 8 minutes for both of the cases like whether it is formulation 1 or formulation 2. So what is what information is given to us is the uh, population standard deviation okay. So now what they are saying 10 uh, specimens are painted with formulation 1 and 10 are painted with formulation 2 and all and all this 10 and 10 20 are painted in random orders and you are you have been given the means of this 10 specimen like the mean drawing time of the 10 specimens with formulation 2 and 10 with formulation uh, formulation 1 and formulation 2. So we have to draw a conclusion about the effectiveness of the new ingredient. So here another hypothesis will be the mean time taken to dry with formulation 1 and formulation 2 will be the same. So another hypothesis is mu1 equal to mu2 that is the population mean and the population uh, means of the two po uh, population. Okay, And the alternate hypothesis what we are interested in is mu1 is greater than mu2. Why? Because we want uh, the claim is that formulation 2 has a new drying agent that should reduce the drying time. So the mean of this particular formulation mean drying time of this particular formulation 2 is less than mu, uh, mean of population 1 okay formulation 1 that is the alternate hypothesis fine and sigma 1 and sigma 2 are given as 8 minutes. Okay, I am writing 8 over here, but it has a certain unit associated with it, 8 minutes over here. The sample sizes are n1 equal to n2 equal to 10, alpha is given as 0.05, x1 bar and x2 bar are given to us. Now let us try to solve this in Python. So first of all, we will import necessary library. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, is this a case of unknown and equal or is this uh, it's just known and... Uh... Yeah, the population standard deviation is known to us. Okay, it's already known. It's not the unknown and assumed equal, right? Yeah, it's not unknown. Okay, sure. Yeah, they would have clearly mentioned then, uh, like uh, uh, if population standard deviation, uh, here they are specifically mentioning the population standard deviation, but okay. if it were unknown, then they would have not mentioned it at all. So then we will have to calculate it using the sample, like uh, either they would have mentioned the sample standard deviation is so and so, or yeah. they would have given the samples, like the data points in sample. So then we'll have to compute the sample standard deviation given the samples. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we are importing SciPy which contains this module stats which is having all the probability distributions. Then after that we'll, we are using NumPy, Math and Pandas. We'll see like uh, we'll be using this later but the important one is uh, SciPy.stats. Okay. And then we are declaring certain variables over here and assigning them certain values. So sigma 1, sigma 2 are the population standard deviations, n1, n2 are the sample sizes, alpha is our significance level and x1 bar and x2 bar are given to us. Okay, let me run this. Okay, by the way, uh, for those who are new, uh, all this material will be shared and it will be available uh, at the link in the uh, YouTube video description. So whenever you go to my YouTube channel, you will find under the under the video in this YouTube uh, like video description, you will see a link over here which will redirect you to a folder, drive folder in which you will find all this material like the slides as well as the uh, Google Colab notebooks. So the platform I am using over here to code Python is in Python is Google Colab. Uh, it is uh, like it gets stored on drive and it is easy to use on any of the machines you may have. 
So yeah, I prefer to use this, but you can definitely use uh, whatever uh, you are comfortable with, uh, either Jupyter Notebook on your local system or any other uh, platform. Fine. Okay. So I hope the screen is visible. Okay. So this is about the PPF like uh, or inverse CDF. So it's just an introduction. So Z alpha, we are computing Z alpha. So uh, in the very beginning of this session and in the previous session as well, we saw like given the value of alpha, we want to uh, uh, find out the point Z alpha. So, okay, let me go to normal distribution. Say this one is uh, our Z alpha and this particular area under the curve is our alpha, okay? Or let us see two. This particular area is alpha. So this particular area, the other area will be one minus alpha. So given this one minus alpha, I can find this value two over here using percent point function, okay? So given alpha, I can find one minus alpha and given this one minus alpha area, I can find the value of two. So in this case, what we are doing, we have been given alpha value. Okay, why are we are doing uh, this? Because here the alternate hypothesis is mu1 greater than mu2, which uh, comes under upper tail test. So we are looking at the upper tail or the right side of the distribution. If it were the other way around, we would have looked at the other end of the uh, distribution. But uh, since it is symmetric, uh, it it won't uh, it would have not mattered much. Okay, so yeah, so first of all we are finding Z alpha. So Z alpha is stats dot norm dot ppf one minus alpha, and then I'm just printing printing the value of Z alpha over here. Now we are computing the Z statistic. Why? Because the population standard deviations are known to us. So Z statistics will be X bar, X1 bar minus X2 bar. Ideally it should have been X1 bar minus X2 bar minus mu1 minus mu2. But here we are assuming that this mu1 and mu2 are like, if it is, if it is uh, like Null hypothesis is true, then mu n minus mu two is zero, so that's that's why it's not mentioned over there in the formula. So uh, you can ignore that. So z is computed as x one bar minus x two bar upon square root of sigma one square by n one plus sigma two square by n two, uh, as we saw in just now, like some time back, variance of the distribution of differences of sample means, or uh, samples that are computed over two different populations. Okay, so sigma 1 square by n1 is a uh, standard deviation of x1 bar and uh, sigma 2 square by n2 is standard deviation of, sorry, variance of x2 bar or the second population. Fine, so we compute the z value. Let me run this. Okay, so we got the z value we got the z alpha value. Now, based on this, what can you conclude with the critical value approach? Z is greater than z alpha. So, let me go back to iPad. So you got, so alpha was given to you, you got the corresponding z alpha. Now you computed z, so z alpha was found to be 1.64 something, okay let me confirm, yeah 1.644 and so on 
and you computed z. And it was found out to be 2.51. So, where will it lie? It will lie over somewhere over here, say. So, what can you say about the rejection of null hypothesis? Are we going to accept or reject the null hypothesis? Reject the null hypothesis. Yes. So, we are going to reject the null hypothesis because the probability of, okay, uh, yeah, Nikhil, you have any query? Oh, nothing for me. Yeah. So, the probability of occurrence of Z uh, or the event, uh, let's say small z greater than this capital Z, whatever we have found, will be this blue color area, right? This is nothing but the p value. So, the probability of occurrence, uh, the p value is less than alpha when z is greater than z alpha. That is very clear. So, just the two names are given. This is known as critical value approach, where this z alpha is known as critical value. So, if any way z value falls beyond this, it will be rejected. The null hypothesis will be rejected, which indirectly men mentions that the p value, the probability will be less than probability of making type 1 error. So, this, this is even rarer that this particular event and the events rarer uh, than that like are, are basically like uh, uh, rarer compared to making the type 1 error. So, in that case we are going to reject our null hypothesis. Okay. So, coming back to the question. Oh, okay, is the screen visible? Laptop screen? Yes, it's visible. Yeah. Okay. So we have computed Z alpha over here. We also computed Z. So we saw that Z is more than greater than Z alpha. So we can straight away conclude that we are going to reject our null hypothesis. But we can also compute the p value using this particular Z value. So it will be nothing but one minus start sort CDF of Z. CDF is nothing but so, given the value of say I have been given this 2, so CDF will be this particular area under the curve till 2. So, probability of occurrence of values less than equal to 2 will be your CDF. Okay. So, I have this z value, I can compute the uh, area under the curve till z and then subtract it from 1 to get the p value. Okay. And if you see p value over here, okay, let me just confirm this. Okay, am I making any mistake over here? Uh, anyone? Uh, am I with everyone? Like, uh, are you getting this? What we are doing over here? Can I repeat the question again? Okay. No, I'm just saying like, uh, are you getting like how we are doing solving this problem, particular problem? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, we are just written a function over here, like, uh, getting to get the z and the p value given the sample uh, like means sorry sample means the population standard deviation of the two populations and the and uh, the sample uh, sizes so let me just uh, run this and we can pass this on 
all our data to this and we'll get this particular values okay so based on that you can conclude uh, whether you are going to accept or reject your null hypothesis or not so we'll quickly move on to the other problems and then we'll uh, see uh, ANOVA in the uh, we'll touch upon ANOVA I'm not sure if I'll be able to cover everything in that so we'll see ANOVA in this class and then we'll see randomized block design and two-way ANOVA and linear regression in the next class okay but I'll, uh, as I said I'll definitely point you out to the video links like uh, the videos on YouTube where you can see or uh, like uh, grasp these concepts in detail later whenever you have time so yeah please uh, look at the video description uh, I may not add it right away like uh, uh, please give me some time like I I'll also have to find out the videos and then I'll definitely put that into the video description fine so here are like in the previous case like the sample uh, means and other things were given to us uh, in that in this case we have been given the sample with different values so what we are going to do is like first of all let us first read the question and then we'll move on okay let me see maybe I'll just keep this uh, the last one and then we'll see ANOVA in detail okay so two catalysts are being analyzed to determine how they affect the mean yield of a chemical process. Specifically catalyst 1 is currently in use but catalyst 2 is acceptable. Since catalyst 2 is cheaper it should be adopted providing it does not change the process yield. A test is run in the pilot plant and results are shown in table. Is there any difference between the mean yields? Use alpha equal to 0 0.05 and assume equal variances okay so a null hypothesis is the means of the two populations are same alternate hypothesis over here is they are not same and in this case we have not been given the population standard deviation okay so only the sample values are given to us so using this okay so let us define this things we have defined alpha over here and two lists in python which are containing all these values catalyst values and these are nothing but some so this is a t test right sorry uh, this for this question we have to use t test right uh, first question no for, for this question we have to use uh, t test right yes yes uh, whenever you don't have this uh, population standard deviation known uh, yeah. yeah whenever it is unknown to you you are going to do t test sure sure yeah but uh, we just discussed i think you were not there so as we like increase the sample size like the number of data sample points is greater, sample, than 30, greater than 30 we have to use z test right it's not like using z test it's like using t test with sample standard deviation but in that case the Z distribution values and the T distribution values will be similar. So you can refer to the Z table. So oh. as you increase the uh, sample size, the, de the decrease of freedom for T distribution will also increase and it will tend towards normal distribution. So that's why you can use the Z table values directly if the sample size. So it's like, so Professor Ravish has mentioned you can use Z test, but the Z test is with. Uh, sample standard deviation and not with the population standard deviation. Sure thing. Yeah. But statistically speaking, we have to use only while well, on paper, we should use uh, t-test, right? It is t-test, but uh, uh, Professor Ramesh has specifically mentioned z-test, but with uh, sample standard deviation. So if you are mentioning z-test, so you will have to have this extra information with sample standard deviation, not with the population standard deviation. Sure thing. It's actually like t-test. But yeah, he's mentioning it as Z test because the value of the Z t distribution and the T distribution will be same. Actually, actually for, for an example, I do have a doubt regarding like an exam point of view. Mm -hmm. You have a number of uh, formulas to remember, right? For example, uh, there is known standard deviation, there is unknown standard deviation, assumed equal and uh, assumed unequal. Yes. As well as there is for variance as well as population. Yes. So like, like, do you have any ways to probably remember that? 
even i don't remember it exactly but yeah i kind of like try to prepare a tree chart diagram over here like let me just share that with you we just you know, like cheat sheet or something like that so that uh, prior to uh, yeah so you can or something like that or applying for like doing doing it in real time yeah so i kind of like prepared this chart over here like uh, it's not looking that great but yeah so it's like you have for two population like two sample tests like you have this sigma square and sigma 2 square known and yeah. unknown so in that case you will have the z test and you will compute the z statistics like this and then in the case it is unknown you have two cases when the two populations are having same variance yes. and different so in that case like you will be having t tests with t statistic being computed differently in both the cases in the first case it will be like with the pool sample standard deviation and in the other case with uh, degrees of freedom being calculated in a different way so you can prepare it similarly like need not be like what i have prepared it's all messy right now but yeah you can prepare it and then try to remember okay, okay. Yeah. so actually if you have a cheat sheet or something like that do uh, share unfortunately i don't have it like i myself have gone through the lectures and prepared this <laughs> yeah sure yeah like uh, like generally to be honest like preparing for an exam or interview or for an example if you are into a you are actually putting this into a real project or working on it so uh, i thought okay is there yeah. any way if, to... if you are working on a real uh, project like it's it's not an examination you can always refer to online resources that i can say because we ourselves don't remember all the things uh, when i do uh, coding for machine learning or say any other uh, purposes yeah so i don't remember exactly like uh, the formula and all like it is re- important though like for yeah. some of the so for example i work with uh, gaussian mixture models so these are like the probabilistic models in uh, like in machine learning okay statistical machine learning so i do work with uh, gaussian mixture models and i i'm supposed to know the mathematics behind it but if it is someone like who just wants to use gaussian mixture model for some classification task so the person may not uh, need not know like what exactly is happening the mathematics uh, behind that but ideally you should be knowing it but it's not always necessary in certain scenario like it depends on the problem at hand like what kind of i'm i'm doing research over here so i am supposed to know about it but if somebody just needs to apply it to do some get certain inferences so they may not you know like you do not know how the the formula of t distribution is right like if you show, if i show you the formula of t distribution it will be like something like this gamma of gamma function of v plus 1 by 2 and all that so you are simply using it like you are you are not knowing the mathematics behind it so it depends on the problem at hand like what scenario you are in like so uh, but from the exam point of view whatever is being covered in the course you are supposed to you uh, know that and it uh, yeah it is uh, it 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 varies from pe- person to person like how they kind of no, 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 try no. to uh, yeah actually preparation come. varies from person to person yeah, that yeah. is a good thing but like the thing is that you immediately recover or, uh, anywhere like that so i thought okay uh, for an example you have for methods or function we have a cheat sheet right yeah. so i thought okay probability and statistics also you might uh, have also like that yeah so exa- i'm not sure like uh, i mean i don't I, at least i don't have the cheat sheet but yeah uh, definitely you can Uh, refer to the slides uh, sure, sure, sure. and then try to uh, make your own uh, notes out of thank it. you thank you dash yeah so okay coming back to this okay i am not sure if i'll be able to cover an hour today but yeah let us quickly see this so we have this x1 bar computed like the means computed using the lists then we have sample sizes same in this case n1 equal to n2 equal to 8 and uh, you could have also done this using len of uh x1 bar that is also that will also give you the length of the or size of the sample then we are computing the sample standard deviation by the way but uh, using this numpy library np.std we are passing this list to it and there is this one more extra parameter that you might not be familiar with that is ddof1 so it represents you have to compute sample standard deviation or not the population standard deviation so we are giving that so the degrees of freedom in this case when you compute the sample standard deviation it is n minus 1 so this particular one is nothing but sample size minus that k so if you uh, put k over here the degree of freedom is 
and minus k whatever sample size minus k so it depends on what you are uh, looking into but in this case it is sample size uh, minus 1 so that's why we are passing this particular thing if you don't pass this it is by default 0 then it will compute the po it will assume this is a population data and it will compute the population uh, standard deviation which we don't want like we don't want to divide uh, like we don't want n in the new uh, denominator we want n minus 1 for that you are using this specifically like passing this extra parameter okay so we have the stand, uh, sample standard deviations so yeah uh, we are computing it over here like NP, uh, SP square these are some extra variables that I am introducing but it is uh, not uh, means you will have to refer to the formula over there like uh, you may not be uh, taking this uh, directly like knowing this directly. So here what we are doing over here is we are taking this pooled standard deviation n1 minus 1 into s1 square this particular thing double star is square then n2 minus 1 into s2 square and n1 plus n2 minus 2. So this is the degree of uh, freedom for the t test that we are going to use in this case. Okay, And we are using this pooled standard deviation. Uh, this is uh, a variance and then the square root of it will be the pooled standard deviation sp. And then uh, let us just print these values. And based on this we will compute our t statistics that is x1 bar minus x2 bar divided by square root of uh, it will be like if you take this uh, inside it will be sp square by n1 plus sp square by n2 sp is just taken out so it is sp into square root of 1 by n1 plus 1 by n2 so that is how we are computing t so we have our t value over here the, the t statistic and alpha by 2 so since this is like uh, our alternate hypothesis is mu1 not equal to mu2 uh, where we have a strict inequality we are going for two tail test hence we are computing alpha by 2 over here in order to uh, either you can compute alpha by 2 and then okay let me go back to iPad if I say in words it will be confusing. So I have this alpha concentrated on both the tails. Now I have to compute the t value, the t statistic. It can be somewhere, okay, over here. So uh, whatever area under the curve I'll find, I'll have to make it double because it is symmetric in nature. So you can either compare this say this is a so this is also be going to be this is also going to be a so you are going to compare 2a with alpha or a with alpha by 2 if you want to do a uh, hypothesis testing so if a is less than alpha by 2 or 2a is less than alpha it's the same thing a less than alpha by 2 and 2a less than alpha so then we are going to reject the null hypothesis. So in this case also, oops, sorry, I, I was not uh, like on this screen. Okay, uh, uh, sorry for that, like I, I kind of like I was on the uh, collab notebook and I was sharing this, so it didn't get recorded. So what I was saying, like let me quickly uh, uh, show this again. So we have alpha concentrated on both the tails alpha by 2 alpha by 2 and then you are computing a t statistic it can be over here so in this case you are going to compare either this particular area with alpha by 2 or twice of this area with alpha so that's what i was trying to say so either you compute alpha by 2 and compare it with the p value computed over only one tail or just uh, double it and then compare it with alpha either way is fine okay so let me resume the share fine 
So here alpha by 2 we are computing alpha by 2 then t alpha by 2 will be starts dot t dot. So in the in instead of norm we are using t distribution over here. So if it were like normal distribution it would have been like starts dot norm dot ppf but here we are using start dot t dot ppf with alpha by 2 and degrees of freedom for that particular t distribution that is n1 plus n2 minus 2 in this case. So we will get t alpha by 2. So you can see t alpha by 2 is less than t. Uh, let me go back to iPad. So, the t alpha by 2 value that we computed was, uh, let me go back here, minus 0 0.35, okay, it is on the other side. Okay, and the t value, the statistic value that we got Okay. Oh, my bad. It is not minus. Uh, it is minus two point one four four, and the t that we got was minus zero point three five. So clearly, t is greater than this minus two point one four four. It is lying in the acceptance region. So, we cannot reject our null hypothesis. Uh, Revantia, yeah, I will be sharing this notebook like it will be in the folder, drive folder that uh, that will be there in the, the link to the drive folder will be in the video description. Okay. So we have this t alpha by 2 computed over here and we have the t value. So t value is uh, the t is greater than t uh, alpha by 2 which is in the acceptance region and hence we are going to uh, not reject or accept an hypothesis which we avoid saying we are not going to reject an hypothesis. Okay. So this was using the basic things like computing t value and then uh, computing alpha by 2 and then comparing alpha by 2 with the t alpha by 2 and so on. But in sta stats uh, like scipy.stats there is this direct function t test independent, independent t test wherein you can directly pass on a uh, catalyst one like the two list and the assumption over here equal variance equal to true. So, here the assumption is that the two particular uh, samples like population are having equal variance. So, the variance is the standard deviations of these two particular samples may not be the same. That is why we are taking this pooled standard deviation and saying that both the uh, samples are having this pooled standard deviation. So, in this case, you have this extra parameter wherein you pass equal variance equal to true and it will internally compute all this sp and the other statistics and give it return it. So let me just run it quickly. So you see over here it has written statistic minus, uh, three po minus 0 0.35 which we computed manually and then the p value, p value will be area under the curve for this particular uh, t statistic over here. So it will be np dot Okay, let me just compute it over here. Start dot t dot cdf. If you pass this zero point three five, or let me just pass t directly. Okay.
Oh, I have to pass my bad. I have to pass the degree of freedom as well. Yeah, so this is the uh, difference between uh, Z and T. So you'll have to take care that whenever you are doing any computation with respect to T distribution, we'll also have to pass the degree of de uh, degree of freedoms in that. So in this case, it was n1 plus n2 minus 1 and uh, minus 2. So you can see it is 0 0.36, which is computed over 1 tenth. So you'll have to make twice of it and it will be 0 0.72. Uh, is it clear to everyone? Sorry, why twice? Okay, so the T that you are computing is over one tail, right? So this is a two tail test. Let me go back to it. Okay. Uh, is it clear? Yeah. Yeah, okay, fine. So, <coughs> sorry for that. Yeah, so uh, stats.t.cdf. So this is computed, being computed over one tail. And since it is a two tail test, you are going to have twice of it. So that is the value that is being shown over here. Okay, and degrees of freedom are n1 plus n2, that is 8 plus 8 minus 2, 14. In this case, uh, the only difference is that here the assumption is like the sample standard deviations, like the populations are having different uh, standard deviations. So, the formulation will be different. So, you will have to find the degrees of freedom separately using the formula uh, as expected and then compute the t statistic and the rest of the procedure will be same. So, only difference over here is how we compute this t statistic. Okay. So, in this case it will be np dot square root of s1 square by n1 plus s2 square by n2, the rest all is same and then the degree of freedom, degrees of freedom of the t distribution will be computed like this. So, what is the d d o f uh, when you calculate yeah. this? Uh, yeah. Yeah. We just discussed this. So, d d o f it represents that you have to compute the sa sample standard deviation and not the population standard deviation. If you simply write n p dot s t d x 1, it will assume that the population data is given to you and then it will compute the population standard deviation. At, that is, it will divide the uh, summation of uh, x1, x, xi minus x bar square with n and not with n minus 1. So, to mention that specifically that it has to be divided by n minus 1, we are passing this parameter. Okay, then this is just the information and the parameter has to be set. Yeah, so this pa parameter, like since it is sample standard deviation, you want it to be divided by uh, 1 by a, uh, n minus 1 like uh, it needs to be divided by n minus 1 so that's why you are passing this one if it were like if the degrees of freedom are like k uh, sorry uh, n minus k so then you will have to pass k over here so it is like if you are passing k over here the degrees of freedom is sample size minus k so for sample standard deviation since you divide it by n minus 1 you, you are passing it 1 over here is it clear Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, sample standard deviations are computed, sample means are computed, and you know the sample sizes. So, you can compute this degree of freedom. <coughs> this is the same formula that uh, Professor Ramesh has mentioned in the slides. So, <coughs> we are computing this degree of freedom of the t distribution, and then you are computing t statistic. Then, for that particular computation of CDF, you are passing this T value computed over here and V as the degree of freedom instead of N1 plus N2 by 2, uh, N1 plus N2 minus 2 over here as in this case. You have computed the degrees of freedom and then passing it on to this particular. <coughs> Apologies for my voice. Yeah. So, yeah, so rest of the process is same. The difference is, only difference is the sample standard deviation like the we are assumption is that the population standard deviations are different hence we are using this particular formulation okay i hope this is clear to everyone uh, we'll move on to the questions and then we'll see if uh, yeah we can cover uh, uh, other topics okay so this question was like two uh, uh, sorry for an uh -huh. actually after this there is uh, dependent samples and uh, variances and population 
Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, I thought of covering that, but it will be difficult to cover everything in this session. So it's like, uh, if you know the basics of this, like it will, you can interpolate it to the proportions and variances. So uh, proportions will also have a Z test. There, there is this Z proportion test and all. But okay. in the case of uh, uh, variances, you will have chi square test over there. So F, F test is there, F right? Test, yeah, F test and chi square tests. So yeah, we'll we'll discuss F test in ANOVA, like when we'll come to ANOVA. So I think some of the topics will get covered over there. Okay. So because like dependent chapels examples, if you discuss mainly it'll be of okay. a. So here, uh, so okay, I'll just tell you the difference between dependent and dependent samples. So here you are assuming like so in this case there were two species of species which we wanted to see like if the two species are different or not. Now, in case of dependent samples, so let me give you an example. Like there are a uh, set of people, uh, you are measuring their health condition or the blood sugar level. So that is like before the medicine is given. So you are computing the blood uh, sugar level of a certain sample of people and then you are giving certain medicine to them. And then after giving medicine, you are again measuring the blood sugar level. So here the two samples, that is the first sample without giving medicine and the second sample with medicine, these are actually the second sample is dependent on the first one. Okay. So in this case, these two samples are not dependent because the underlying population or the sample is the same. The only thing is like you are for doing some uh, uh, processing over there. like. In this case, you are giving certain medicine and then recomputing the blood sugar level values, like the mean blood sugar level of the sample of people. So that is the case of uh, dependent uh, samples. So yeah, there are certain like th there are tests for that. Like, uh, but I'm not sure if I'll be able to cover it. We'll see. Like, if we get time, I'll cover that also. But I wanted to cover certain topics, uh, like. If you know this thing, knowing that uh, will be easier for you. Like, or like if you know two independent uh, sample test, like independent t test. So, knowing uh, like understanding that will be easier. Uh, uh, what I think, but if it is not, like please let me know. I will try to discuss that in one of the sessions later. Uh, is that fine, uh, Nikhil? Sure, sure. sure. Okay. okay, I'll try my best uh, because uh, actually already we are running like one week behind the schedule. Yeah, 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 so yeah. yeah, I wanted to cover the major topics like uh, and was assuming that uh, like knowing this will kind of like help you to understand the other topics in that. Sure. Topic. Yeah. Okay, let me see like if I can cover that. But yeah, let us let us see that. Okay, so let us go on to the next question. Okay, in this case, it was a uh, t-test with sigma unknown when you wanted to see the differences between two species. Now, this question is, in the previous question example, what if you wanted to know whether the mean length of fishes is the same or not for multiple species of fishes living in the pond? What kind of test will you use over here? Okay, so this is a question you may not get such theoretical questions in uh, uh, like examination. You will be given some options and you will have to select some option from that. But in the previous case, you are having only two fishes. Now you have multiple fishes, and you want to see if the if the means of these multiple fishes or the groups are different or not. So what kind of test will you use over here? Uh, Should we use the F-test here actually? Hmm? Should we use the F-test here? Okay, F-test we have not discussed. So yeah, whatever uh, we have discussed so far, based on that, what will we dis uh, what will what can we use over here? Okay, let me share. So because standard deviation is not known, probably T-test will be used. Uh, yeah, that is fine. Uh, so in the previous case, we were having only two species of fishes, right? Yeah, here two or more species are there. Okay. So in the previous two case, or more means ANOVA will come. Okay, I'm coming to that. Okay. 
so we have two population we had two population uh, fish species one fish one and fish two and we wanted to see like if the means are statistically different or not like the means of the population are statistically different but in this case now so here we went uh, with t test independent t test okay now we have more than two populations and we want to know if the means of this population are different so one option is to do t test multiple times that is taking two two at a time so out of this three I am taking two at a time. So, how many such uh, pairs will be there? Three C two. Is that correct? One, two, and three. Six. So it will be six. So it will be nothing but one and two, one and three, two and three. Wait, 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 wait. Not six. What will be three C two formula? Three factorial. Three minus two factorial, and two factorial. It will be three into two into one, upon one into two into one. Three, right? So there are this number of pairs, like one with respect to two, one with respect to three, and two with respect to three. Okay, so these are the pairs. So I can do t test for this, t test for this, and t test for this. But what is the problem in this? If I do t-test, independent t-test on two two samples at a time, means two two groups at a time. Do you see any issue with this? There will be lot of approximations, and uh, that's why the result may be, you know, deviated yes. from. Yes. So what, are, what are these approximations? Like, what kind of errors you are going to make in that? So basically, going to make like more type one errors. So like for uh, yeah, exactly. So Mr. is right. So for every t test, there will be associated type one error. So as you do this multiple t tests. You are kind of like accumulating all that type one errors over multiple tests, and it will be uh, kind of like growing more. So to avoid that, we have something called as ANOVA, that is analysis of variance test, which we use to see if the population, uh, the means of the population, different multiple populations, is different or not. Okay, so let me resume the share. So the answer is ANOVA, and why ANOVA and not t-test that we have already discussed. Like we are going to move make uh, type one errors on every single test that we do, like t-test. So we can't afford to have like this errors accumulating over multiple tests. So we do on single test that is called as ANOVA or analysis of variance. So what are the assumptions we make in ANOVA? Uh, this is just for your information. It's not a question actually. Uh, that is that would be asked in your examination. But yeah, so the assumption is that all the population, uh, like the in the case like fishes, uh, the distribution of the population of fishes are normally distributed. I mean, they are normal distributions. Okay, and the variances are same across all the population or all the groups. And the data that were collected using statistically valid methods, and there are no hidden uh, relationships, uh, relationships of among the among these observations. So whatever observations you are getting, for example, I am taking the mean length of fishes in a certain group, and across all the groups, and there should not be any relationship between this uh, any hidden relationship between the observations, like. Uh, for example, all these observations are independent of each other. Means uh, the mean length I am computing for a one for a fish in a given group should be independent of the mean length 
being computed for the uh, or the length computed not the mean length the length computed for a given fish in a group should be independent of the length being computed for the another fish in that particular group so that independence should be there so three conditions first all are normally distributed the populations the variances of these populations are same third the observations that you are getting from a given population these are all independent and there is no hidden relation uh, ships in among the observations okay so these are the assumptions of anova and there are different types of anova like one way anova two way anova like we will see what these uh, different types are and in between we will have randomized block design as well so we'll look into that okay but uh, yeah does anyone know what uh, okay for those of you who know what anova is like it will tell like uh, if the population means are same or not but it won't say which me population means are same and which ones are different like if even if there is a difference it will just point out that the dif there is a difference the our null hypothesis is like mu1 equal to mu2 equal to mu3 for three population case or all the three the same like valid conditions or only two of them or uh, no 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 three of them like the assumptions of this particular anova are all uh, these all need to be made uh, then only you can apply anova like so now we are assuming that the data it may not be all all correct all the time but we are simply assuming that the data may not always be normally distributed but in most of the cases we assume it to be normally distributed and then apply this thing. that itself is an error in many of the cases but yeah that is like uh, acceptable to some extent okay so uh, what anova will do so anova so for example you have three population so the null hypothesis will be mu1 equal to mu2 equal to mu3 that three populations are having same mean they are not different but and my alternate hypothesis is mu1 not equal to mu2 not equal to mu3 means like these are not equal at all but we don't know which one is not equal to which uh, like which ones are equal and which ones are not equal anova doesn't give that information like anova only will tell if the alternate hypo if the null hypothesis can be rejected or not it doesn't it doesn't say which means are different and which means are same it can be the case okay let me just show you on ipad so let's see this example itself over here okay so this is mu1 mu2 mu3 so mu2 and mu3 are almost same and mu1 is different than mu2 and mu3 so but what anova will tell it's like you are just rejecting this null hypothesis anova will simply reject or accept the null hypothesis but it won't specifically mention which test uh, which will uh, which means are different uh, which populations are uh, groups are different so for that you need to do extra analysis and then this extra analysis is uh, called okay let me just share the screen again i'm not sure again like if i'll be able to discuss this in detail but we use this post hoc analysis or tuckis test to identify the identify which means are different like which populations are different so anova tells you if there are differences among the levels of independent variable but it does not tell you which differences are significant to find out uh, the treatment levels differ from which treatment levels different from another we perform this post hoc analysis or tuckis test uh, there is a 36 minute uh, class on uh, just post hoc analysis i think so yeah uh, please look into that uh, i'll try to cover that but yeah i'm not very sure again like if i'll be able to do that in the in this online session but we'll see if it is possible so the main thing that we all will have to understand is anova because most of the concepts later are based on all this uh, uh, things so i wanted to discuss this particular example wherein 
uh, you have three groups and you wanted to see like if these three groups are different or not. The null hypothesis is that the mean, so these are samples taken from three different groups and based on which you will have to infer if the population means for these three groups are same or not. So you can do it using ANOVA but I am not sure if I will be able to do it now, it is already time 8 o'clock. So yeah, we will do one thing, we will uh, solve this problem manually uh, towards the beginning of the next session and then we will see how to solve it in Python. So we will see ANOVA and then we will move on to randomized block design, then we will see two way ANOVA, like there are certain terminologies on associated with ANOVA, we will also look into that. So for example factors and all you would have come across this. So I do not want to discuss that right now. So yeah, we will we'll discuss this thing in next class and then we will solve some problems based on that. So yeah, I will I'll anyway make these slides vis uh, available to you, like they were, I also prepared slides for week 6, we were discussing week 5 right now. So I will upload these as well, so you can look into it if you want to and there are, uh, there is one problem also solved for this particular problem like uh, in python and we have some more problems as well over here. So you can definitely look into it at your own pace but yeah we will discuss this in detail in the next session. Uh, any queries so far? Okay, uh, please let me know like uh, if you find it difficult to understand anything. Uh, you can let me know in the next session and I will be happy to answer that. So yeah, we will conclude this session over here. Any query? Come. Yeah, um, sir, actually I have joined only today okay. and uh, I have, uh, it may not be relevant to the topic which we have discussed today, it is okay. something very uh, generic. Okay. I, I found that uh, a lot of mathemat like mathematical equations are being used. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, I'm basically a, a core develop, developer. I have never worked on data science. Yeah, that's what I was actually like. Nikhil also had the same same query. I think like so. Yeah. We discussed that. Uh, you when you are working at uh, product development uh, level, like you need not know all this mathematics. Like if you just want to apply these things over there, but it is good to have uh, like from from exam point of view. Definitely, you will have to know these yeah. things but not in core details, like you need not know like what is the formula of T distribution. You are simply using T test and assuming that the T statistic is having a T distribution. But yeah, you need not know the very mathematical details of the T distribution at all. But whatever is being covered in the course, on a superficial level you are uh, expected to remember. But yeah, it is all, it is not always possible to remember everything and it depends on how you can uh, grasp that. So I suggested uh, like you prepare your own notes and try to compress information like there is a lot of information in the material shared uh, on Swayam portal. So you get only the important information like you prepare your tree diagrams and something like uh, maybe I will quickly show you what I showed earlier to everyone. Yeah. Not a great example but yeah let me just show that. Actually, uh, uh, just before that can I Huh. Can I ask you one one more thing? Uh, I was actually specifically looking for uh, uh, any video links or any. Yeah, player. I'll also I, uh, that also I discussed uh, like so I'll also be providing certain. Can give me idea. Okay. Yeah. okay. So. I mean, can get, okay, go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So let me answer your first query. So uh, how you can uh, grasp those things? So you can compress the information in whatever format you want. Like I quickly like kind of messed it up over here, but yeah, I may. I drew this tree diagram to remember like the different sort of uh, test that I need to do when dealing with two population means. So similarly you can prepare in your own way like what you want but compress the information it is like too much of information given in the slides and in the lectures so you will have to like uh, get that uh, compression and uh, answering your second query. I will be sharing like I will try to share like I, I may not know like uh, uh, like all the perfect material for all these topics but if 
even if i don't share let me just share my screen i just says i, I was googling uh, yeah. essential mathematics for data science no no that will, the... you will have to be very specific about it like if you want to see anova like let me just show over here yeah uh you want to understand anova yeah so you will have to be specific about what you want to understand in that so you'll get multiple videos over here so right so there are like depending on the uh the views and all you can decide upon if the particular source is relevant or not like if it is authentic source or not but there are certain sources like uh, by definitely this uh, data tab is a good source but there are other sources like khan academy so if you just see uh, anova khan academy yeah so you'll get all this videos over here so khan academy is one of the reputed uh, uh, of, like sources uh, available which provide to, like uh, tutorials on multiple like varieties of topics and you can yeah. definitely look into it and there is another channel called db statistics uh or db stats i think okay i don't remember exactly the name of that channel i i think i shared it once uh, okay basics of probability let me just say basics yeah i'm actually looking for basics because yeah. i have lost touch with uh, all this yeah sorry not db statistics jb statistics so yeah so you can look into jb statistics and then there is this playlist called basics of probability over here in even hypothesis testing is also available in this kit so yeah look into this like this is very good actually even i uh, referred to this particular videos and got certain uh, doubts clarified so yeah i try to put all these links in the video description but yeah definitely you can also uh, check that on your own but you will have to be very specific about it like what do you want to search yeah actually i was looking for a playlist in nptel itself uh, nptel i won't recommend like because nptel the issue is that it will be like course over 12 weeks and you don't want to spend time uh, uh, like a 12 week time on because yes i'm i'm a bit uh, hesitant yeah. to so, but yeah. i have got all my basics here i'm i'm being very yeah very... so that's why like you will have to have so for every basic concept you can have another uh, like independent tutorial uh, like you can refer to any tutorial available online you need not look into nptel uh, courses yeah, yeah. Okay. so basics uh, of if you just see these basics of probability these are all like 15 minute 12 minute videos like so you can definitely look into this okay yeah. and like would you is there a document where these topics are mentioned that okay for getting into this course can you like the, these are the base, these are the topics which you should cover uh, in prerequisites you mean yeah yeah, yeah prerequisites yeah prerequisites uh, basically like uh, see uh, for this particular thing probability is must probability okay yeah and you can name them actually i mean because it will be recorded right it it is as good yeah. as so probability yeah. and uh, to some extent linear algebra i would say and basics yeah. of programming so these are the three things that you may need linear algebra is not much needed over here but in machine learning probability and linear algebra are the, the foundations of machine learning uh, so we'll be discussing uh, linear regression later which is again a part of like a machine learning as well so yeah a little bit of uh, linear algebra might be needed but probability theory is must wherein you will have to have basics of probability and then advanced probability concepts like uh, probability distributions and the expectations variance and all these things statistics basically so probability and statistics so if you go and try to understand every single concept uh, it will take time but you will have to be very specific like if for this particular course if you want yeah. to see like if you if you are finding it difficult to understand that concept like say how to compute cdf uh mm-hmm. cumulative distribution what is cumulative distribution function you can simply just go and search what cumulative distribution function is like and then you will kind of like get n number of videos out, out of which you can just look into one of this so, got yeah you need not take the entire course but you have will have to be specific uh, about it like which topic you did not understand from the course and then you can go and look into that makes sense makes yeah. sense
So yeah, it's it's not humanly possible also to like understand every single concept in probability. Even I don't know. I myself don't understand many of the concepts over there. Right. Yeah, but definitely I even if I uh, if I want to use something and I don't know, I just go and then search for that. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Could you could you please suggest some material for randomized block design? Randomized. Just suggest. Mm, yeah, I have not referred to any online material for randomized block design, but yeah, I'll definitely look into it. But I'm not very sure, like if any other material. Yeah, definitely there will be material available online, but I have not looked into those. And I would suggest you also go and then look into one of the sources. But I'll I'll try my best to search for any okay. good material. Yeah, but I think Professor Amish's video on randomized block design it kind of like shows you an example, like uh, he mm, yes yeah yeah he kind of like uh, explains it with an example but to understand it yeah, let me check it like Khan Academy has a very good uh, tutorial on ANOVA uh, but yeah let me look into it and then I'll let you know in the next okay, session. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, so we'll begin in the like we'll resume in the next session like next week. Uh, if you have any queries like please let me know uh, during the next session. We'll try to solve them. Okay. Thanks a lot for joining the session, and I hope it was uh, useful. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining. I'll end the session. <laughs>